All righty. Thank you so much. I'm just going to bring up my screen here and hopefully it all is cooperating. It all look good on your end? Looks great. Excellent. Well, good morning, everybody. It's a, a pleasure to join you today. Uh, my name is David Strauss and I'm the executive director of the Association for Commuter Transportation. And uh, some of you on the call are, are members of us and uh, I greatly appreciate uh, your continued involvement. And for those of you who are not, um, hopefully are, are perhaps convinced by all the great work we're doing to uh, join our community. So the Association for Commuter Transportation is the leading organization for transportation demand management professionals and organizations. Our goal is to build a, a strong community of, of individuals and organizations working to advance and implement TDM at their work sites and within their communities. ACT is your organization for the latest information and best practices on TDM. Our 1300 members uh, represent major employers, universities, city-state uh, DOTs, MPOs, transit agencies, transportation service providers, TMAs, and other stakeholders focused on creating a better journey for everyone. ACT provides you with valuable professional development opportunities with dozens of virtual and, and soon our first in 18 months uh, in-person events a year. Uh, ACT supports your growth as a professional from the moment that you enter your career uh, in the field until you retire through mentoring, leadership development, and our recently launched professional certification that through, via the TDM CP exam. ACT really works to advance the entire TDM industry through advocacy and influence of federal, state, and local policies that are supportive of TDM. We're actually at a really important uh, point in time in regard to building support for TDM at the federal level. And I'll spend some, uh, some time later in a few moments uh, going through that in a bit more detail. So ACT's policy objectives are really focused on, on the following uh, cornerstones. First and foremost, it's all about commuters. And trans the transportation policy should focus on creating a multimodal system that moves all people. Uh, policies should encourage investment in and adoption of new technologies and really working to you know, remove hurdles that prevent new practices and new business models from being able to take place to increase the efficiencies of our systems. ACT as well supports policies that bring together all stakeholders in the planning and delivery of transportation solutions. Across the nation, employers, TMAs, along with private sector mobility service providers are really taking an active role in improving the nation's transportation systems and public se sector entities should be exploring opportunities to really collaborate. And you know where we're seeing great impact is especially in, in regions like Austin where you have a strong TMA, you know, being able to leverage at that public private sector partnerships uh, really does wonders for improving options uh, for, for the users of the system. And then lastly, performance, especially today, we must focus on the most efficient use of our limited public resources, which require a shift in the way decisions are made and which projects and programs are funded. <coughs> Sorry. ACT supports uh, policies that really compel decision makers to find the best solutions that focus on creating efficiencies within our transportation system, which is really core to TDM. But before I get started, I understand that we have a wide range of stakeholders on the call today. So I wanted to just start with getting us all on the same page when it comes to transportation demand management. So TDM is really this broad umbrella of strategies that aim to create the most efficient multimodal transportation system that moves all people with the goal of reducing congestion, improving air quality, and stimulating economic activity. At its core, TDM is all about providing real options for all, you know, with a significant focus on the commute trip, reducing traffic congestion by shifting people's uh, mode choices away from single occupancy vehicles, 
improving air quality through shifting our dependence on carbon-based fuels, and connecting people to jobs and supporting economic activity. So implementing TDM really requires action and engagement from all levels of government and collaboration between the public sector and the private sector to be successful. At the federal level, transportation authorization really sets the tone and provides the financial resources and policy structures to implement TDM at, state, at the state and local level. Commuter benefits are established by Congress and are perhaps our most impactful tool to incentivize, uh, to incentivize mode shift through the employer. And with the new Biden administration, we're also seeing a return to conversations about more aggressive climate action. Last year's report from the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis will actually help guide some of these actions. And TDM was actually incorporated and identified as a key strategy to reduce mobile source emissions that Congress should look at in expanding and providing greater support of as it moves forward. At the state and local level, Entities can develop TDM plans that set out goals and provide a structure for near-term actions as well as the long-term projects to, to build off them. Developer requirements can include incorporate actions like the installation of charging stations and in, in infrastructure to support active transportation modes, as well as requirements to participate in organizations like movability you know, and other transportation management associations. Parking supply, including the type of spaces, can also be influenced by the local jurisdiction in collaboration with developments. And then we have nonprofit, you know, or, or you know, non-governmental organizations like TMAs who really work to implement those local TDM plans. They're the foot soldiers out there on the ground trying to make, you know, make TDM a reality and and provide the solutions to commuters. They can aggregate the provision of services, most commonly the you know, sh uh, shared shuttle services, uh, as well as other commuter benefits programs, which presents an opportunity to reduce the individual cost of shifting to uh, you know, shifting modes. The TMA then also takes on marketing and promotion activities um, you know, in, in support of, of some of these city and, and regional goals that are out there. And then there's the employer side. And when committed, employers can actually be the greatest influencer of mode choice uh, there is. They can establish the corporate culture that can have significant impact on adoption of, of various modes uh, and the reduction of driving alone to work. And they provide the menu of commuter benefits, including the, trans, you know, the qualified transportation fringe benefit, shuttles, EV infrastructure, and even incentives to purchase um, electric vehicles, electric bikes, or, or even, you know, where people may choose to live uh, to really help guide in that decision-making process. So that's kind of a quick once over of, of, of TDM and the various players at the table. Um, and I wanted to shift over uh, kind of with all of this, you know, in mind, um, what we're doing at the federal level to really help expand the adoption of TDM and its use across the country. So we've been actually working the last couple of years to develop and advance uh, what is called the More Through TDM Act. It's the first piece of uh, legislation ever focused on, on transportation demand management. Uh, it was first introduced in 2020 uh, and has been reintroduced in the 117th Congress by Representative Chewy Garcia uh, out of Illinois. Um, many have asked why legislation is needed. Uh, well, we've, you know, for those of you in the field know, uh, we've struggled for years and, and decades to really gain attraction for transportation man management. There have been challenges with accessing and using CMAC funds for TDM work, and those that do often run into changing guidance uh, that can add confusion and delays and even financial repercussions that uh, could harm organizations. So it's time that we, as an industry, really focus on uh, our efforts to include TDM as a go-to strategy within federal policy. Currently, it appears nowhere within the FAST Act. Um, eligible TDM strategies vary by region, depending on how states and federal highway staff 
interpret the use of CMAQ and other resources to support you know, TDM programs. There's no dedicated funding for TDM strategies, which means TDM often competes for limited resources. And, and as well, you know, we believe there just should be greater support for TDM uh, in general. So the legislation does many things, but first and foremost, it defines TDM. And working with Act's Public Policy Committee, a lot of feedback from congressional staff, we actually introduced this definition of TDM within the legislation. And getting a definition may not sound like a lot, but what we have been told by federal highway staff is without that definition, it makes it very challenging for them to be able to understand uh, what can be and cannot be funded. Uh, and they've, they've recommended you know, to us to, to get a definition adopted uh, to provide greater clarity for USDOT about the role and need for TDM. Uh, as well as its ability to receive funding through federal programs. Uh, so definition is one. It also sets out definitions for TDM strategies, making it clear that behavior change, marketing, incentives, technology strategies are all eligible projects within TDM. It also defines transportation management associations and makes them eligible recipients for funding, uh, in addition to regional commuter programs and technology providers. Um, the bill includes requirements for incorporating TDM within a long range transportation plan and really, you know, making sure that TDM strategies are looked at uh, across the country to solve and address the transportation challenges that are facing states and regions uh, across the country. And most significantly, the legislation uh, establishes a new TDM program. The bill calls for $250 million a year over five years. And the funding would be available to all states that have TDM plans in place. There'd be a portion kind of in a similar way to the CMAQ program of portions and funds. And competitive grants would be available to entities to support the implementation of projects and programs identified within those statewide TDM plans. <clears throat> so eligible projects on this, you know, would include a broad mix of themes that you can see on the screen and whose outcomes really meet the goals established within TDM to reduce congestion, improve air quality, you know, while also moving people. Uh, and that's kind of the key, you know, the project should be addressing all three of those, not just a, uh, uh, you know, one portion of that. Uh, and for the first time, uh, you know, the More Through TDM Act would actually, you know, make it very clear that marketing and promotion are eligible projects through Federal Highway. Uh, which is a key aspect of any successful TDM program. In addition, the More Through TDM Act would expand the list of traditional eligible entities to clearly lay out that TDM service providers, organizations like Movability, would be eligible for funding, or uh, well, would be eligible to apply for and receive funding through the TDM program. It would be a huge victory for, for many of our members and for many of the programs uh, that have struggled uh, to receive funding across the country. The more, you know, the act would also establish state national advisory committees to support uh, that kind of third policy cornerstone we have of collaboration. You know, successful TDM has always required strong public private partnerships to ensure that this is taking place. The legislation would require these advisory committees to be established. At state level, the committees would bring together uh, transportation agencies, private sector employers, nonprofits, to really oversee the development of the, of the TDM plans along with their implementation. It also calls for a, a similar advisory group at the federal level that would bring together the multiple agencies uh, within the federal government uh, to ensure that TDM is looked at as a strategy in regards to not just transportation, but housing and economic development, emergency preparedness, disaster response, uh, you know, all important areas that require that ability to provide options and, incur and ensure that individuals can move from one place to another without the use of a, a single occupancy vehicle. So over the past couple months, we've really made great progress um, on, on our legislation. The More Through TDM Act was reintroduced. We're building co-sponsorship for it right now. Uh, but we've also been successful in incorporating the definitions of TDM and TDM strategies 
into the Invest in America Act. That's the House legislation that would serve as the uh, reauthorization of transportation funding at the federal level. Um, we've passed some additional amendments into the Invest in America Act to incorporate TDM as a part of CMAQ. And now we're working on the Senate side to influence their version of the authorization bill. It's a greater challenge than on the House, but we continue to you know, keep our chin up and, and, and move forward. I encourage all of you on the call today to really you know, voice your support locally for TDM with your local members of Congress. Um, and as always, ACT is here as a resource uh, and to assist in any efforts that you may have. I wanna thank you all for your time and you know, happy to take any questions. Great, thank you, David. Um, in the interest of time, we're actually going to move to our next panel to make sure that all of our panelists have time to um, you know, um, provide their information. Um, but if you guys have any questions, we'll be sure to get that over to David um, and get that answered for you guys. Um, with that in mind, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our next panel and our next panel moderator. Um, panelists, can you start um, making sure you get yourself on um, video and turn off your mute while I do that? Or, Unmute yourself while I do that. So um, our next panelist is an interdisciplinary perspective on regional mobility. Um, our, panel mo our panel moderator is Sandy Guzman. Uh, Sandy is the Chief Executive Officer for the Austin Area Research Organization, or ARO, a nonpartisan nonprofit organization of businesses and civic leaders across the region that focuses on long-term challenges and solutions to enhance the economic and social well-being of all, all Central Texans. Transportation policy has been a constant focus throughout Sandy's career. Before her role at Arrow, she served as the legislative director for former state Senator Kurt Watson, supporting his state and local transportation agenda. In addition, and possibly most importantly, Sandy serves as the vice chair on Movability's board of directors. Um, and with that, Sandy, you can take it away. Thanks, Anton. Well, as we heard from David, access to affordable, reliable transportation options is a key contributor to a region's quality of life, equity, and economic security. Maybe not quite in those words, but that's what I was hearing. And traffic, as we all know, is just plain annoying. <laughs> so you're going to be hard-pressed to find someone in Central Texas without an opinion on why we need better mobility and how to achieve it. So I'm really excited for today's panel. In your day-to-day -day life, we probably all hear, traffic sucks, why haven't they done something to fix it? Well, they is we, we are the problem, so we all need to be involved in trying to fix it. And we're going to hear today from representatives of five organizations who view the need for improved mobility through the lens of their organization's perspective, which I think will help, help undergird the discussion that David had of the different types of solutions that um, TDM includes, that transportation demand management includes. So I'm going to ask each of the panelists to answer the same three-pronged question. Um, we're going to ask folks to move through in just a couple minutes each so that hopefully we can get back around to have time for questions from the audience. First, I'd like to welcome Matt Geske. He's the Vice President for Regional Infrastructure and Mobility with the Austin Chamber of Commerce. So Matt, if you'll tell us why improving regional mobility is important to your members, the businesses of our community, what are the top concerns or projects y'all are working on right now, and how transportation demand management plays into those discussions. Thanks, Sandy, and I want to thank uh, Movability and Lisa Kay for, for having me, and I think this is a very, very important conversation that we, we need to have uh, amongst our region um, uh, yearly, annually, and going into the future. So, um, yeah, so we, we represent uh, a little over 2,000 member businesses uh, in our region, um, and in my title, I uh, have regional uh, uh, infrastructure mobility. So we, we not only look at sort of the central business core, but also uh, pretty much the Campo six county region. Um, and so according to Site Selector magazine, uh, out of the top 10 wants or needs of companies looking to expand or relocate is number two is transportation, just behind workforce and talent. Um, and that's been steady for, for the last 10 years. And so when we're looking at when we're talking to businesses and companies looking to relocate here, you know, they're always asking, what, what does the transportation infrastructure look like? Um, so it's a quality of life issue, and it's also for uh, their employees who may be coming from areas of the country or the world where they don't own a car. So, um, you know, and also we have, you know, factors uh, in play that make it even more impo 
important to have sort of multimodal transportation options and TDM is one of those. You know, we have a population boom has been going on, it seems like 10, 15 years now, but I think the latest stat I saw is close to 200 people move here a day. Um, we have housing affordability. It's getting, it's getting much harder for middle to lower income uh, workers to find a home near uh, workforce areas and then job center distribution. So I just recently saw a study done by JP Morgan that showed people are becoming more comfortable with a 90 minute to two hour commute one way. So that's three hours to four hours round trip. Now, I grew up in a small, smallish town. And so thinking, you know, anytime something was 20 minutes away, it was frustrating. But, you know, now I've lived in, in the Austin region for quite some time. And, you know, 20 minutes is sort of like you're going to the store time. So two hours is, to me, is insane. But you have people that are coming to jobs, which is great. Uh, and they can't afford to live near those job centers. So how do we figure out how to get people uh, to those jobs more efficiently and uh, uh, quicker uh, while also managing how do we uh, look at job distribution. So uh, when we're working with in the six county region, like say we get a, uh, an RFP uh, to our office, we don't just keep that within the city of Austin. We work with all the municipalities and counties uh, to, to find out if it's a good fit for their, for their community. So that's one way we, we try to address sort of the job distribution. Um, you know, we were big supporters and still are Project Connect, which is a great first step in getting people, uh, more people move more efficiently, especially in the urban core. Um, and I'm, I'm hopeful in the next 10 to 15 to 20 years, um, it will become more uh, uh, expanded throughout the region. Um, also, our MPO, Campo, um, has done a fantastic job sort of planning for the future and how we uh, you know, primarily build our road system. Um, you know, just on my wall here, I'm looking at, I know, I know Commissioner Long's on the call. So she gave me two maps a couple of years ago of the controlled access facilities sort of future looking of Williamson County. Um, and, uh, you know, that's something we, we need to look forward to. And, and also, more importantly, and sort of the overarching theme I like to tell people is we need to think regionally. So, you know, we're a we're transportation agnostic. So if it makes sense to put a light rail, let's do it. If it makes sense to build a road, let's do it. If it makes sense to put a bike lane, pedestrian walkways, let's do it. So um, I think that is something, you know, looking for, I think Campbell also needs to start considering um, more transit related options. And of course that's based on their own community's needs and wants. Um, and then last, I probably went over my time, Sandy, so my apologies, but I will say that the state um, and uh, I just saw Representative uh, Israel log on. So how's it going? Um, we really need to look at how we fund transit in our state. I think a lot of communities are forced to make the decision on economic development or transit. It's a, it's a you know, lose-lose situation for them because communities are looking at other transportation options, but they're also having to compete for these companies that are coming there. So I would really love the state to look at uh, updating that model. Um, I have a few ideas, but uh, anyways, I'll let, I'll let the others talk. So thank you. Thanks so much, Matt. Uh, next, Catherine Kragos, Head of Strategic Initiatives for the Housing Authority of the City of Austin. She's going to talk to us the same thing. You know, why is access to mobility, regional mobility, important to your organization, what you're looking, working on right now, and how transportation demand management works into those conversations? Thanks, Sandy. Uh, well, I, I share the perspective of a Hauser. Uh, the Housing Authority of the City of Austin, uh, it's one of the oldest housing authorities in the U.S., and um, we serve about 5,000 people in public housing at our 18 properties and about 6,500 families who have vouchers, housing choice vouchers, and they use those on the private rental market. And those vouchers are portable. They can go anywhere. So our, our properties span from north to south across mostly the eastern crescent, and um, you know, while housing, we see it as a platform for opportunity. One of the things you'll hear um, it, at your local housing is that, you know, there are two great barriers to family self-sufficiency. One is childcare and the other is transportation. And so transportation, regional and multimodal can ensure that every family, that every senior can achieve um, family self-sufficiency and quality of life. Um, a couple of years ago, we were in the midst of a digital inclusion initiative uh, to connect every Hakka family. 
and we hired a, 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 about a dozen residents to educate their neighbors, advocate in the community, and we started to find that residents were wanting to use digital tools to mitigate transportation barriers. They were wanting to learn how to have groceries delivered. Um, they were wanting to learn how to, hey, if I get a, a digital thermostat um, with the internet in my apartment, can I adjust my thermostat remotely if I get a second shift? Um, those kinds of things. And so we had started to kind of chip away at that. But fortunately in 2016, Next Century Cities and Transit Empowerment Fund backed a vision that we had, the amb ambassadors had to use um, a variety of tools to eliminate the transportation barrier. And I'll just share a couple of things that we've learned in the past, um, in the past few years from, from our ambassadors work. Um, and, and, and this informs our interests in multimodal and regional transportation. Um, our interest is in ensuring that families have choice, that they can choose where to go to school, where to worship, where to buy fresh food, um, where to work. And um, when mobility ambassadors held their first participatory GIS uh, focus group with their neighbors, they passed out digital and paper maps. And they asked a question they had been working on for a long time, which is, tell us where you go and how difficult it is to get there. And so the, the room was silent and people started drawing on their maps and, and suddenly a man at our Booker T. Washington property stood up and he said, you're asking me the wrong question. You're asking me where I go and how difficult it is to get there. You should be asking me where I don't go because it's too difficult to get there. And when the mobility ambassadors started asking their neighbors, where is it you don't go because it's too difficult? They started to say things like, I would like to go to the same doctor I've had who can't afford to have an office in my neighborhood anymore. He's moved to Cedar Park. I would like to take my kids to the Zilker Kite Festival or the Dell Children's Museum. I would like my daughter to be able to go to the Ann Richards School and for me to feel that she can do that safely from, my, from where I live on my property. And so when we, are, when we think about regional and multimodal options, those options are opening up those kinds of choice opportunities for our residents. Um, another interest families have is not having to choose which adult in a household will work because they only have one vehicle. Um, you know, residents at our 18 properties, they're earning typically between ten dollars and $14,000 per year. And our goal is to help families as quickly as possible, on average about six and a half years, use their time in housing to gain that education and opportunity uh, to achieve their, their goals. Um, ultimately, when a family leaves housing, there's a, a, a place for the next family. Of course, the American Automobile Association says it costs $9,900 a year to own a car. So there's a complex calculus that um, families undertake when they don't have multimodal options. Um, when, for example, at a Thurman Heights property, I'm thinking of a family where dad was offered an $18 per hour job, 17 mile commute to Pflugerville, one mile commute to an $11 per hour job where he could pick the kids up after school. Family made the decision, mom's gonna quit her part-time job so she can drive dad. Bought a Saturn van, 2001, difficult to get parts, terrible gas mileage. And um, you know they made that decision to invest in their future. But if you think about multimodal options, um, we have a family at Chalmers uh, Court who three family members got uh, jobs where, where, with the help of a jobs coach. And um, they were trying to make that decision about who's gonna take the car. Uh, it turns out that um, they could use multimodal options. Mom takes a, a um, e-bike to the train, son takes the car, and the other son uses a scooter exclusively for work. Our families are also interested in equitable data sets. They're not using that language, but they're saying, wait, hey, I'm hearing about big data. My, my neighbors aren't using a smartphone to plan their trip. How do they have our data? They're asking about that. And, um, and, and ultimately about resiliency and crisis response. Uh, we are very fortunate to partner with Cap Metro um, and other you know, transportation providers. Those transportation assets combined with the housing platform make for great resiliency during COVID and the winter storm. Thank you so much, Catherine. That was very insightful. I really appreciate your comments. Next, we're going to hear from Jeffrey Tiwawa. Jeffrey's with the Real Estate Council of Austin. They're the folks who are building the housing and the commercial buildings we've got out there. So they've got you a different perspective. He's vice president for, public, for policy and government affairs. Jeffrey? 
Thanks, Sandy. Uh, and thanks to uh, Mobility for for having us. Uh, you know, again, want to you know talk a little bit about uh, something Matt referenced about you know that study where people you know have that ninety to two hour commute, and I'm one of those people. Uh, I live uh, in Dripping Springs, where I just so happen to serve also on city council uh, out there, and I have on occasion had that two hour commute, and it is not uh, pleasant, but it is becoming a reality, and I think. When we look at our region and we think about, you know, giving people access to to mobility, it's about giving people options, but also finding ways, especially in this summer we talk about La Rica, ways to concentrate, you know, options for services in specific areas. So people have uh, the ability, you know, uh, uh, the speaker before me talked a little bit about, you know, you know, lady who wanted to, to still go to her doctor and he had to move to Cedar Park and stuff like that. And a lot of we see that happen all the time where you know, all these services are having to move out because they're getting priced out. And so for us, it's really a question about, you know, looking at a 30,000 foot level of development and how can we not only provide more housing uh, on the ground, but make it to where all of these goods and services are able to, to be uh, either in one place or in a concentrated uh, place. And, you know, we were very instrumental working on Project Connect and, and pushing and advocating for that. And I think one of the key things that's important as we look to now, okay, we're getting ready to construct it and put things on the ground, is we need to make sure that we're, we are figuring out where can these transit oriented developments, which, you know, really isn't just about the light rail, it's how do we make sure that there's, you know, bus access, you know, to their house, their, you know, parking rides, you know, for other people. Uh, I, I always joke a little bit about Randy that with Randy Clark at, at Cap Metro that if he, you know, puts a, a really nice parking ride there at Oak Hill, you know, I'll, I'll commute, you know, all day long on a bus rapid transit or, or light rail. Uh, I think we're probably about 50 years out from, from that one. But, uh, you, you know, I think giving people options is, is what's, what's important. And it's about how all of these things uh, layer together uh, with each other. And you know, I think Austin does, I think, a really good job of not understanding how, how these things layer together. And we need to do a much better job about how all of these things uh, work together because then it, it makes uh, everything add up. So the person who you know is having to commute in has options for going, you know, you know either back home or, or you know dealing with with daycare. And I think you know we're, we're one of the things we're working on right now is the downtown density bonus program. And you know one would think that in your downtown area you want density to be there, but our code uh, forces. Um, a lot of these developments to be, you know, really underdeveloped. And so developers are forced to take the density bonus because the entitlements that exist there uh, aren't sufficient. Uh, and so then it kind of forces us into this negotiation uh, pattern with the city, which really isn't the way you should be doing it. And, and I think another thing that's important to understand is as we start adding these different layers to those, those developments, it just exacerbates not only the cost, but also the, the process. A great example, you know, we've talked for a very long time about getting rid of parking minimums uh, downtown and the things that, it, would, that, that it, it could potentially do. And one of the challenges we have is because of the parking requirements and how they compete with things like the watershed department, for example, a lot of times, you know, our members are digging holes in downtown Austin, not for a parking garage, but for a detention pond. And then they have to stack the parking garage on top of that. And that's why you end up having these parking garages above ground, even though they probably in some instances went the same depth of the parking garage underground to build that detention pond. Uh, and those are all things that I think we have to, to think about. Uh, and then you know, the last thing I'll say is we really you know, do need to think about more regional infrastructure and how all of that uh, works uh, and, and combines together. I spent some time uh, years ago in, in DC and you're talking about you know, two states, you know, Maryland, Virginia, and then the district uh, all working together in the way that they all, all you know, figure out how to move people, not just on highways, but on the transit systems, you know, something like that. I think we have to start thinking uh, about that into the future. And I think Project Connect is going to help with that, but we really need to, I think, be talking about more because what, you know, right now, uh, people in Buda and Cedar Park are commuting in and really in, in you know, the next 10, 20 years, it's probably going to be more so people commuting from New Braunfels and maybe even, you know, Colleen. And I think that that needs to be part of the, the conversation, I think, more. Thanks so much, Jeffrey. I love the framing on this. We've kind of gone from regional to really the micro level back regional again, and we're going to get local again with Cody Ross Cowan, who's executive director of the Red River Cultural District. 
they're you know in the middle of downtown and if you look at a five mile radius from downtown 36 percent of all of our jobs in the whole six county region are located in there but you don't have 36 percent of the people living in there so a lot of folks looking to deal with commuting and those folks who are lucky enough to live nearby cody i'll let you take it over from there thank you uh, Cody County, Executive Director of Red River Cultural District. Uh, I, we are the music area in eastern downtown Austin between 4th and 15th Street. I represent over 40 organizations, chiefly cultural tourism businesses like restaurants, bars, and live music venues, but also organizations like Waterloo Park, Waterloo Greenway. Uh, I kind of consider that eastern strip of downtown between uh, the MAC and UT is the Music Mile. So this is where musicians find their careers, where uh, service industry workers come to support the growth and the health and the, excite the excitement of Austin, but also uh, we, we support the brand of the city, right? Because we have the largest concentration of live music venues uh, in the country uh, in the heart of downtown, over uh, 15 currently. So I think uh, I really digged what uh, Jeffrey was commenting on since I have experienced top to bottom in industry working in that sector for over 20 years. I mean, <clears throat> affordability has just changed everything, particularly from low income workers like service industry workers and accessibility, I think is really uh, chief amongst those issues. I mean, for those of you who are downtown or have worked in industry, I think you've noticed how uh, much we've celebrated the nightlife economy here in Austin, but we haven't really taken ownership that now of the fact that we're a 24 hour economy. I mean, what, how does this translate? This translates down to the micro level of parking, uh, where we have really, we have different rates in different parts of town. We have kind of like Epimethean thinking, not just in parking, but in planning in general, as it pertains to the growth and the sort of richness of our city. Um, you know, i would strongly recommend that we, inside of planning, we look at how to address affordability for parking for workers. I mean, many workers come downtown either by Lyft, Uber, or to park their car uh, if they can afford a car, and that can account for anywhere between 30 and 50 percent of, of projected income for the night. Uh, even if we have a surplus of stock, that makes that particularly difficult for folks. When local bands have to park their their vans or tour buses that comes out of pocket. Um, but just think about if we pivot back to buses and transportation in general, uh, buses stop at midnight, right? So both, both fans, guests and workers are typically out until two or in the workers case, three or four in the morning. You've, you've basically created a setup that folks have no options, right? And I think if we really want to hold on to the good in this city, we need to think uh, in terms of how does this affect um, those folks who have have who are most vulnerable in terms of income, and also where do these routes and where do these proposed new systems for implementation? Who do they affect and who did they commit to serve? Where are people living and working right now? I mean, all of these sort of factors, all of these things have to factor in. I think in terms of how we more holistically approach transportation and through this sort of Promethean planning, capturing how we're going to hold on to those, that facet of culture that we know and love about Austin. That's all I got. That's great, Cody. Thank you so much. And I love, you know, housing affordability is something that, you know, it's a theme across everywhere that you go these days, as much as transportation always has been for the 20 years that I've been in Austin. And so it's of course appropriate that we've got it here too. The other thing that is a constant in the Central Texas region is our environment. Our last panelist is Jenny Burden. She's the program manager for Texan by Nature. And she's gonna talk to us about the importance of mobility from her organization's perspective and how transportation demand management solutions factor into what they're focusing on right now. Thank you so much for having me. And speaking of traffic, I apologize if there's a lot of noise coming. My office is right next to a busy street, and that's certainly picked up in the past six months. So um, but thank you so much for having me. For those who have not heard of us before, um, Texan by Nature, we're a nonprofit organization that operates uh, statewide, and our mission is bringing business and conservation together. So um, we don't start our own projects. We don't work on our own 
you know, particular species or region or anything like that. Um, our biggest interest is increasing investment in conservation, awareness, and keeping it part of the conversation. So how that fits into mobility and transportation um, may not seem apparent at first, but to us, it's incredibly important and incredibly relevant because it does touch everything from, um, as we've mentioned, businesses, from housing, from entertainment, anything that any of the other panelists have mentioned, conservation can and should also be a part of that um, because green space and you know good environmental spaces improve the quality of life for all of those other aspects of our communities. Um, so where Texas My Nature gets specifically involved, um, we've got a couple of projects going on right now. One is with Capital Metro and um, we started this last year sort of after Project Connect became um, a sure thing and we've been working with them because in conversations with them they said you know we've got this funding, we've got all these amazing opportunities, and we want to make sure that conservation planning is part of that. So we, they're utilizing our expertise and helping guide them to how can we integrate um, green space and conservation into transit stops, into um, you know metro rail stations, into any of those things. And so we're helping them come up with creative solutions as far as that goes, um, because. As we all know, especially communities who are having to depend on this transportation, often they're also the ones who do not have equitable access to green space and nature and the other types of areas that are hard to get to. I'm sure, as you know, Catherine mentioned earlier, they would love to go to Zilker Park, but that's not accessible to them if they only have one car for their family. And so bringing green space and habitat and um, anything like that, even if it's just a pollinator garden at a bus stop, still improves the quality of life in that community. So to us, that's incredibly important because you know, all Texans deserve that access to green space. They deserve um, having the benefits of that. Um, one thing that COVID certainly highlighted was the importance of the outdoors. Um, when we were all forced to stay separate, everybody went outside and um, park usership went incredibly, just exponentially higher than normal. Um, bikes are now impossible to get because people are wanting some kind of active transportation or just activity to have. And so what Texan by Nature is doing is trying to use that data, use those anecdotal situations that everybody can see right in front of us and say like this demonstrates how incredibly important having nature, not only from a public health perspective of people being able to get out and get outside, but also just a mental, physical, all of the things that make Texans healthy can come from our natural resources. So to us, anytime we can get involved in transportation in that aspect, we're there. Um, outside of the Austin area, we're also working with um, a transportation project over in El Paso called the Paso del Norte Trail. And this is a really cool initiative, um, especially if you've never been to El Paso, they're very far ahead in their thinking wherever possible. Um, and so they're putting together, it's gonna to be over 60 miles of trails that connect the county end to end, not only you know across El Paso County, it's going into New Mexico, it's going down into Ciudad Juarez. Um, so it's connecting that uh, multinational community uh, where people are getting across every day, hopefully to cut down on traffic on the roads, providing safe places for people to get to and from. And along this trail, in El Paso, it's not green space, it's brown space, but um, they're still, they're integrating habitat into those trails. So they're put in burrowing owl habitats, which is exciting for the community, gets them excited about nature because they've got this urban wildlife now in their backyard. Um, pollinator uh, habitats all along the ways, which is just beneficial you know, to the community in so many ways. Um, also edible plants, um, educational signage. So there's a lot of really creative ways that they're bringing nature to these communities that have not had access to it before. So we try to share those types of projects through our mission with you know, municipalities across the state to inspire those ideas and try to make it standard practice um, because that's, you know, we believe as far as, you know, sharing those best practices and getting people excited about conservation getting people to see the importance of it will then incur additional investment in it and just snowball from there. So thanks so much, Jenny. I really appreciate you bringing home this point that we can't look at any of these issues in silos. Everything interacts together and our solutions are going to be that way too. Gone are the days if they ever existed that there were silver bullets to solve any problem. <laughs> 
And so I really appreciate all of our panelists today for sharing your insights and your thoughts on how we can work together to continue to keep Central Texas the place that we love. And Anton, I'll turn it over to you to hear from our elected officials and the great work that they're doing to help with those provide those options we've all been hearing about so far this morning. Awesome, thank you so much everybody on that panel. Um, thank you, Sandy. Um, so yes, like um, Sandy mentioned, our next panel is gonna be with our elected officials, but to kind of give us a little and you know, some of our elected officials may not have been able to join us for the entire um, panel that we just heard, which had quite a bit of great insights. So I'll do a short little recap of everything we just heard. Um, in the meantime, I'll give that, I'll give our um, elected officials an opportunity to turn on their webcams, unmute themselves, um, and prepare for their panel. Um, so things we heard, some major themes that we heard were things like um, having access to transportation transportation is a quality of life issue. It's an access to work issue. Um, having multimodal transportation is gonna be very important for regional goals like affordability, population growth, job distribution, things like that. Um, we heard some people speak about how we are funding um, multimodal transportation, specifically things like park and rides and um, mass transit. Um, multimodal um, options give people greater opportunity to find to um, climb over barriers like um, self-sufficiency regarding childcare um, and transportation. Um, it gives families more choice in where they want to work, buy groceries, have leisure activities. Um, and I think, you know, we heard a lot about um, affordability um, and getting more people into the urban core as well. Um, so I think a lot of those things kind of are hitting on the fact that transportation is more than just transportation for the region. It hits on so many different issues. And so I think that's a great preview for um, entering our elected officials into the conversation who um, have a lot to have a lot of, let's say, leadership um, in the field of not just transportation, but how it connects to all of these different issues in the region. So I will introduce our panel moderator, Judge Brown of Travis County. And then I will hand it over to him to take it from there. So Judge Brown is um, serves as Travis County Judge and is working towards making Travis County a safer community by investing in access to healthcare, including mental and behavioral health resources, and by improving access to transportation um, and transparency for the county services. Um, Judge Brown, I will hand it over to you. Awesome, thanks Anton. It's a huge honor to be here and to be moderating this great panel of elected officials. Um, welcome everybody being here today. Um, so I'll jump right into it. Um, you know, all my colleagues joining me today um, have really worked hard and prioritized improving mobility in our region. And it really wouldn't be possible, I think, in the short time that we have to cover everything that they've done. So I'm just gonna ask each one a question to kind of focus and highlight on, on the work that they've done in this arena. And y'all can kind of take it whichever direction you would you would like. We'll start out with the legislators, uh, Senator Eckhart and Representative Israel, and then go to Commissioner Long, and then to uh, the, the mayors, Mayor Morgan and Mayor Mitchell. And um, I guess just to start, I think I see Celia, Representative Israel, oh, there's, I see, is that, I see Peter Einhorn, I think, or is that Sarah? I can't tell if that's a picture or a, I guess that's just a photo. Anyhow, I will start with Representative Israel until I see that, that Senator Eckhart is on here. Um, so let's focus on the state. And I realize y'all are not, you know, don't control everything that happens at the state. There's other folks, obviously, that, that do things there too. But the state has a huge impact on our, our infrastructure, our transportation infrastructure and needs here locally in the region. Um, from nearly a singular focus on road infrastructure and the current seemingly political propensity to kind of undervalue demand management and multimodal solutions uh, to employing upwards of 100,000 Central Texans uh, in the state government in, in this area. And with the thousands of those people commuting to the Capitol complex, you know, in pre-pandemic days each day, that number will soon increase by more than 3,000 with the construction of new state buildings in downtown Austin. And, um, just wanted to get your thoughts on how how to deal with this. What's the direction that we need to go? What kind of work have you done in this arena? And oh, I see Senator Eckhart there. So thank you, Senator, for joining us. If you did, you hear the 
the question I just read. Okay, well, why don't you take it away, Senator? And I've got Anton has asked me to, to try to keep you all to four minutes each on the responses. So I'll try to do that, but go ahead, Senator. Thank you for being here today. Uh, first off, Anton, it's so good to see you. We've worked together for a long, long time. Um, this is a great panel. Uh, um, Mayor Morgan, so great to see you. Uh, I miss you. <laughs> Cynthia, uh, Commissioner Long, you and I have worked together for so long. It's so good to see you too. Um, I, I bet y'all never would have figured I would have said that I miss the fights we used to have at Campo. Um, and uh, Mayor Mitchell, I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, what's going on in Kyle as well. I'm hoping that at some point we will expand our regional mobility authority to include Hayes County as well. I think that that'll be necessary for us to get to multimodal uh, in Central Texas. So I'm super excited to be here, y'all. Um, at the state level, I will tell you that multimodal is, is, uh, is not a, a thing. We're really struggling at the state level in terms of um, state funding or state controlled funding uh, coming to uh, our transit programs. Um, also to our demand management programs, including toll infrastructure. I think most of y'all know that I was not a fan of tolling as a funding mechanism way back in the way back. Um, but over years and years and years of the state being uninterested in any other demand management mechanisms, um, I have now uh, come to understand the power of utilizing toll infrastructure braided with our uh, transit infrastructure in order to finally create a multimodal um, transportation system for our growing region. So I'll just take my four minutes to just give you a quick update at the federal level and Celia will probably know uh, even more and be able to, Representative Israel will be able to uh, fill in the gaps. The Invest in America Act was passed by the House at the beginning of this month. Um, it had some great uh, target figures for transit and multimodal. Uh, about half of it was rubber tire infrastructure and the other half was multimodal transit and uh, passenger and freight rail related. Um, once it went over to the Senate side, the negotiations have pulled out uh, a number of significant pieces with regard to uh, tailpipe emissions and the attempts to curb tailpipe emissions in favor of cleaner technologies. I have not seen the draft that is being passed back and forth at the Senate. Um, but they're supposed to be beginning their uh, deliberations imminently. So um, as uh, uh, Steny Hoyer in the House has said, this is more about the art of the possible than it is the art of the preferable at this point. Um, but we do hope to see some federal dollars coming in on uh, multimodal and transit passing through the state that we could utilize. So to be shovel ready, as they say, on those demand management projects uh, so that we can pull down those dollars is gonna be absolutely crucial. And I know that uh, in Central Texas, we can do that kind of collaborative work to have those shovel ready projects, even if the state um, is not quite ready to make that leap statewide. So I will stop there and see what Celia has, what Representative Israel has to, to add to that. Hey, hi everybody. It's uh, I'm more excited to see you than Judge Eckhart is to see you because I'm in Washington D.C. and uh, I'm uh, I'm in a hotel room until Monday because I got the dang COVID. So I'm uh, I'm really excited to see you guys, even even if it's remotely. Um, but I'm feeling good, and um, you know I think uh, it was good for me to kind of listen to to the previous discussion where we talked about the challenges at the local level. As a state official, I think the the creativity and the um, the creativity when it comes to multimodal and affordability has got to come from the local level. As a realtor, um, of course, everyone knows the market just went nuts. It was already difficult. Now it's it's next to uh, it hurts my heart to tell clients just keep driving until you can afford it. Um, the toothpaste is out of the tube on the market. We're not going to go back to even last fall levels, uh, we're going to plateau somewhere, but it's it's not good. 
and we're going to have to up our game as as leaders to talk constantly and hit that panic button on the connection between uh, movability and affordability. I think I think it's got to move simultaneously in everything that we do and in, in, in our brains. Um, where I think the state can help <clears throat> is it, it's an area in which we unfortunately we had several bills, mine included, to, to start putting some money aside for alternatively fueled vehicles. And um, we we you know late hearings are never a good thing, but that's what happened on the house side. Uh, we got distracted here in the house um, and we should have moved forward on, on these types of solutions that would ultimately trickle down and provide some, some more resources to the locals um, so that you could have some, um, some more revenue to set aside for something like a, a creative park and ride at Tech Ridge or um, in any other part of our region now that we're, we're expanding that bubble because, uh, and, I, and I think workforce housing combined with um, transit and transportation and land use has got to be something that we're working on because you can't expect people to teach at Zilker Elementary and um, live in Georgetown, Texas and not, and not think that that's um, doing harm to their family and the family's budget. So it's a, you know, it's a really critical time for our Texas communities and, and our state leadership in particular and I, my hearkening back to the, the, the one area in which, which we can help, and that is um, setting aside funds for creative projects like a multimodal project, whatever it might be. And I, um, it, it's gonna have, to, in my mind, it's gonna have to come from things like alternative fuel vehicles in which we're setting aside money in a purse for that need. And uh, that grew at a faster rate than, than we had seen. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention safety in my comments. Um, we continue, even though it was a pandemic, we've lost far too many Texans still, even during the, the pandemic. It's almost like people cut loose when there was fewer cars on the road. Um, but uh, one of my ongoing initiatives has always been to, to make the standard uh, neighborhood speed limit 25 miles an hour. And um, that... Uh, I think it will it, it it behooves all of us to continue to be focusing on on safety and how to keep our first responders from um, putting on those yellow vests and shutting down traffic on I-35. It puts them in danger as well. So we 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 we've got we've got a lot to do. But those are the initiatives that I was working on: neighborhood speeds, um, uh, and safety, and uh, and alternative fuel vehicles, especially. But uh, collectively, I would like to continue this conversation because I think there's so many ways in which we can we can continue to help each other, even when it's uh, the interim. Um, well, we're not really an interim. We are theoretically in a session. I'm just not there. <laughs> uh, but we are. We have a lot a lot of good discussions that we can do during the interim. So I, I really appreciate y'all's voice and let's let's keep talking because uh, I know uh, Judge Eckhart, uh, Senator Eckhart, and I want to keep helping you. Uh, do good things and uh, amplify your voice. Thank you, Judge Brown. Thanks, Representative Israel and Senator Eckhart. We'll come back to y'all in the Q and A. Um, up next, wanted yeah. to talk with Commissioner Long a little bit. Um, you're obviously chair of Campo and leading Central Texas elected officials, including myself, towards thinking regionally about our transportation needs. In addition to your own work in Williamson County. Could you share your thoughts about the role of transportation demand management in that work? Um, thank you, Judge Brown. And yes, Commissioner Judge, Senator Eckhart, it's great to, <laughs> to see you again. Um, and uh, just really quickly, I think, um, you know, I wear two hats. One is the um, Campo, you know, uh, uh, active member of Campo hat, and then, um, also as a transportation advocate for my own county. Um, and, you know, but I also, one of the hats that I wore prior to commissioner was city council. So I have that unique perspective of understanding city and county. And I think one of the challenges, and I think uh, uh, Representative Ezreal hit on it is with regard to land use because land use and zoning 
Um, that absolutely drives transportation decisions, but it also drives affordability and how um, you know those decisions are made. And so if anybody, you know, the realtors on the line, if you wonder why people are flocking to the counties, it's because it's cheaper to build in the counties. They don't have those same regulations that you have in some other places. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. Beauty's in the eye of the beholder on that. But um, I think one of the things, and, and I will just kind of go back to um, the, the Williamson County perspective, um, we have been very bullish on um, putting together a long range transportation plan, but not just planning for it, but actually implementing it. And we are aggressively protecting transportation corridors. And I'm the first one to say that I don't know 20 years from now or 30 years from now, what kind of vehicles or transit capability is gonna be on those, but I know we're gonna need a protected corridor to do it on. It may be, you know, Randy Clark's coupled buses. It may be all kinds of different opportunities, but we're gonna need those corridors. So we have been super aggressive in working to protect those in Williamson County. And one of the initiatives coming forward that, that we're gonna have some discussion about at Campo is corridor studies. And so I think regionally, um, from a Campo perspective, uh, we, we have to shed our Travis County or our you know, Kyle, city of Kyle hats when we walk into that Campo meeting. And I think that's gonna be the biggest challenge going forward is, is trying to get folks to realize we, we're not there to focus on local roads. We're there to think big picture regionally. And, um, you know, the, the local roads are absolutely important, but that ought to be handled at your city council or at your commissioner's court, not in the campo setting. And so I think we've got some work to do going forward with that. Um, there's lots of opportunity, um, you know, and we've, we've seen that with, uh, telecommuting on steroids uh, over the last 18 months, right? And so um, if anybody, um, you know, one of the, I, I'm, I'm one of the best uh, case studies we can look at is what has happened um, since, you know, the, all the, the work patterns have changed and people are telecommuting more. Um, and we are actively at Campo as well as TxDOT looking at what has happened to the traffic patterns um, with uh, the, all the teleworking that has been happening over the last months. And, you know, preliminarily, what we're seeing is the peaks are shifting a little bit. Some of them are still there. They're not quite as high, but they've shifted and, and really trying to understand what that means. Um, but, you know, I think regionally uh, at, at Campo, uh, and, and I'm going to call on my fellow Campo members that are on this panel to help with that. We need to elevate that discussion to regional discussions and, and kind of focus on that level. Um, and then, but, but locally, um, we, we can't slow down at the Williamson County level. Um, we have to keep pressing forward um, because I think ultimately you're going to have a whole lot more distributed work and the folks that are living in Hayes County or Bastrop County are going to have to be able to get around within their counties. So we've got to focus locally, but we've got to think regionally. Thanks, Commissioner. Um, all right, so now on to the mayors. And uh, so obviously rapid population growth in the region is not just happening in the urban core of Austin or Williamson County, but more, even more so in the suburban areas, <clears throat> rural parts of the region like Round Rock and Kyle, as a lot of residents seek out the amenities that your cities have to offer, but this often comes with a trade-off of reducing viable transportation options. So Mayor Morgan wanted to start with you. <clears throat> if you could just comment a little bit on how is the city of Round Rock working, <clears throat> excuse me, to provide transportation options to residents and visitors beyond drive alone trips? And is there anything that the business community could do to help with those efforts? Yeah, thank you for having me, uh, Judge Brown. And uh, uh, thank you for letting me have a few words with uh, uh, the association. Uh, I'll hit on several of the same themes 
that has been mentioned. Uh, you know, regionalism really does. You know, I've been I've served on Campo now for more than a couple of years, and regionalism is is very very important. And to Commissioner's long uh, point, I think what happens at time even on Campo is you have regionalism versus your own interest within your region. Uh, so you have to try to look at it as a big uh, picture. And a lot of times you do see votes that uh, there's, they're not unanimous votes always. And I'm not saying that you always should have unanimous votes, but when it's a regional um, uh, issue, uh, I think that you have to really stay focused on that. Uh, a couple of months ago, uh, Campo voted on a, a uh, to defer numerous projects from TxDOT to help widen 35 through downtown Austin. And quite frankly, at that time, a number of the local uh, leaders in Austin and Travis County voted against it, while the regional leaders outside of that voted for it. And so you've got things like that that, that are a challenge, um, number one. Uh, number two, with jobs, uh, what, what cities have to do and what we're trying to do really in Round Rock is we're trying to bring jobs to Round Rock. Uh, we don't want our citizens to have to uh, drive uh, into the core uh, of Austin. And if we can do things to create a sense of place, a sense of community, uh, then people want to come live and work and play in Round Rock. And that helps keep a number of um, citizens uh uh, from going having to go down into uh, Austin, and I think we've done a pretty good job of that. We we've incre increased our employment over the 11 years that I've served on the council, uh, and so uh, we will continue to do that and bring jobs. Um, the other thing that we did a couple of years ago, the state legislature allowed cities to enter into uh, partnership agreements with uh, transit authorities such as Cap Metro. Uh, Round Rock uh, did that immediately, uh, and so we've had uh, transit uh, through uh, the bus, uh, through Cap Metro, have had a great relationship with them. Matter of fact, one of the uh, highest volume routes we had was from straight down uh, downtown Round Rock into uh, downtown Austin. Uh, hopefully that will come back and we can get that uh, going. We monitor those routes. Uh, quite frequently to make sure we're reaching the people that need it uh, the most. Uh, you know, lower income areas, help people get to jobs, help people get to education centers, help people get to uh, medical uh, centers. So I'm proud that we have done that and actually have used a lot of federal funds so that we're not all paying it uh, uh, as our citizens. Let me tell you what I think is the biggest challenge, state versus local. Um, you know, what you see going on, uh, as I told the City Managers Association in Round Rock recently, the greatest threat to city government uh, is the state legislature. Uh, no offense to my uh, uh, panelists that serve in the state legislature, but it no is. No offense taken. Uh, Mayor Morgan, you are right. No offense <laughs> taken. <laughs> uh, you know, we're trying to do things at the local level, and we keep getting our hands tied and our hands tied. And quite frankly, that's why you see the uh, the political theater that's going on right now. Uh, we're not focused on the real issues that face this state, face our citizens, and therefore you get uh, bad laws. You get people don't want to talk to each other, and that's what you know you get. Uh, and so it's very frustrating as a local leader that because what everybody sees is what's going on at the national level and the state level. And they're kind of losing sight on what we're doing at the local level. I'll give you an example. We've got a 500, a little over $500 million budget uh, that we're proposing this year. About $130 million of that is for operation stuff, and the rest is for infrastructure. And that's all coming, uh, you know, from our locals, uh, from utility rates, different stuff. We do get some funding with state uh, through Campo, and we will continue to take advantage of that. Thanks, man. Uh, all this costs money. And several years ago, Senator Corona proposed a local option in tax for uh, cities to use for transportation. And I would hope that the legislature would consider that because as Matt said earlier, chambers and cities are using their two pennies to try to bring jobs or transportation or transit. 
Thanks, give us the uh, option to do on. one penny uh, to do it uh, for strictly transportation. Thank you very much, Mayor. Great points. Um, all right, so move on to, to Mayor Mitchell. Got a pretty specific question here for you and you know, take it any direction you want. But in late 2020, the city of Kyle launched a subsidized rideshare program. And I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about it, why it launched and how it's going. Yeah, that is a specific question. I was actually gonna bring that up. So it, it, it works out. Uh, you know, if money grew on trees is the, I feel like that's the theme of the of the panel here. <laughs> uh, it's certainly a challenge, you know, and uh, when I was first elected back in 2016, you know, over the, the statistic that haunted me was that over 80% of the workforce in the city of Kyle commuted out of town, primarily to, to Austin every day for work. And if you've commuted, you know, really from any of the Austin suburbs, but in particular up and down I-35, you'll know that that uh, is a daunting prospect that is only getting worse, you know, as, as time moves on. And so the challenge before the, the, the Kyle City Council as well, it's obviously Campo as well, is, is how do we uh, uh, sort of push or leverage against that, that, that challenge that we all face where so many of our residents live in the suburbs because that's all they can afford, but commute into the urban core. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Mayor Morgan kind of kind of hit, hit the nail on the head when he said that, you know, he, he's thinking a lot more about uh, trying to create employment opportunities within his own community. Because, you know, if you work at Dell and you live in Round Rock, you don't really have commuting problems. And so, you know, that's kind of been our thinking as well, that, you know, how do we create uh, you know, live, work, play environments where folks who live in Kyle can do so affordably, but aren't ha having to shell out a ton of their discretionary income on, you know, auto, mobile, gas, you know, insurance and, and, and all of that. So, you know, back uh, a couple years ago, we uh, were a part of a uh, CARTS program, which essentially allowed for commutes uh, to be, you know, our uh, residents to, to be picked up by a bus. It was like two or three days a week. You'd be picked up at specific locations and you could go to specific um, uh, locations as well. The challenge was the amount of money the city had to pay in order to be a part of that kind of uh, mobility program versus the demand that we had at that time. When you divide the number of unique riders by the total uh, number of uh, subsidy dollars that we were having to spend, it, it was coming up to something like $200 per rider. Uh, so, you know, we had to get rid of that. I mean, you could fly folks to Las Vegas cheaper than you could bust them into the city of Austin. So, you know, we, we tried to just completely rethink the idea of uh, transportation. And, and one of the programs that we came up with, it's a, uh, we're seeing a lot of success is what we call Uber Kyle 314. Uh, and what it is, is from point to point, 24 hours a day, seven days a week in the city of Kyle, using our app, you can uh, schedule an Uber ride uh, and the city will subsidize uh, and the, you know, a, a good portion of that cost. And it'll be about three dollars and 14 cents uh, for each ride, you know, from point to point. And that is that, that has really worked out well to the point where we're expanding it. Uh, we're getting ready to add uh, trips to the airport. Uh, so if you live in our network and are a, a citizen uh, in, uh, of the city of Kyle, you can go to the airport and it, depending on uh, what is charged, you'll never pay more than 31% of your fare and you have a certain allotment there. So, you know, a $90 Uber ride to the fare will only cost or to the, to the airport will only cost, you know, uh, roughly 30 bucks. So, you know, it, and for the city of Kyle, for, from our standpoint, that's a good deal because if we're paying $200 per rider for very limited amounts of rides, specific days of the weeks at pickup locations at eight o'clock, you know, now we're able to completely open that up uh, and we're offering people rides uh, all over our, uh, our town for, you know, for $3 and 14 cents. Uh, so, you know, those are the kinds of things we have to be thinking about. Commissioner Long's point is very well taken about the, the change in telecommuting. Uh, the change in traffic patterns, you know, the, the, the pandemic taught us that, you know, if 80% uh, of our population was commuting, some percentage of that population now is only commuting maybe two days a week and they're staying in our cities and, and working remotely. Well, that's good on just so many levels.
it's for the suburbs because it, it, it provides multiple hours back uh, into their lives. That's time for volunteering, saving money on gas. Uh, you know, it, it's just, uh, it, you know, it works out really well to increase that quality of life. Thanks, man. You know, and then and the only last thing I would say is that, you know, the, the conversation about I-35 is certainly very relevant. Uh, but that said, you know, the probably the most significant regional infrastructure project that has impacted the, the city of Kyle uh, has been uh, the 45 toll road extension in 1626. And those are Campo projects, state projects with local matches, county projects participating to give uh, Hayes County residents a different path into the city of Kyle and connect different parts, not just everybody's connected to the core. So certainly that that has helped as well. Thanks, Mayor. Um, so I think we have, I think, four minutes left, according to Anton. So we're going to do a speed round on the first question here, which is, uh, and we'll just start with Senator Eckhart again. We learned a lot about how to solve congestion with COVID. How do we utilize that knowledge to change business as usual and develop new policies that better manage demand? And if y'all could maybe just like a minute or so each. Sure. Um, I'll just touch on the I-35 expansion project. We definitely have to improve I-35. Uh, I have concerns. Um, uh, I, per, uh, I believe it should be no high, higher and no wider. Um, we have significant capacity. We don't use it well. We don't manage it well. And what we did find out during COVID is that we can manage demand far better than we have in the past. And we could manage that demand through uh, programs that mobility is already engaged in with employers to um, advantage employees who will continue to use um, teleworking for a certain portion of the week to greatly reduce the demand on our current transportation infrastructure, even if their only option at this point is to come in in their car. Uh, if they can come in in their car less, and come in in their car off peak, that does uh, um, great service to the rest of us with regard to a better uh, uh, management of the amount of asphalt infrastructure that we currently have. Um, also, uh, I, I love what you were saying, Mayor Mitchell, with regard to uh, the incredible economic benefits to our surrounding cities um, uh, throughout the region in telecommuting, because you do get uh, uh, your work population staying in Kyle, staying in Round Rock, in Elgin, in Bastrop, in Pflugerville, uh, uh, ordering lunch from the local restaurant, um, uh, you know, uh, doing some spot shopping uh, at, at a break and really pumping up the economy of our municipalities. And we got to remember our major funding sources for our demand management and our transit programs, just like this wonderful Uber program that you mentioned, Mayor, um, our major funding sources are local and federal. The state is not putting money into these things. Celia, Representative Israel, and I will keep trying. Um, but at this point, it's really local money and federal money passed through the state and through the MPO. So uh, let's keep at it. We really did learn a lot from COVID. One of the silver linings is we, we do see ways uh, that we can talk with our employer community uh, about ways to, to continue um, this telecommuting, these ride share programs, uh, and this better utilization of the infrastructure we have. We definitely need more and, and modernized infrastructure. I am not contesting that fact. We absolutely need more and modernized infrastructure. Um, but but we can better utilize it and better manage the demand. Thanks. Uh, Representative Israel, I think we have about a minute left unless Anton gives us some leniency. So why don't you take us out on that question? Uh, well, I mean, I, I, I agree completely with, with Mayor Morgan. The legislature has been um, disconnected from where you guys, where your job is. And uh, it's incumbent upon us to, you know, keep talking, keep sharing and keep working together. And uh, and try to help instead of getting in the way. And I and um, I'm I will help whenever I can from from my perch. But um, it it is it is obviously I've gotten a lot of legislative ideas out there that cost no money that would have helped buses on shoulders telecommuting etc. But they they didn't go anywhere. And uh, and it is it is very 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 frustrating for us because 
especially, you know, uh, Senator Eckhart and I, we love transportation. That's one of our sweet spots, but we don't get to work on it nearly enough. Thanks, Representative. Anton, that takes us here at 11.55. I think that is where we're supposed to end up. Yeah, I, I think we're having a pretty good conversation. So I'll, I'll give the panelists, um, any of the panelists that hadn't had a chance to um, answer that question, the opportunity, um, give you all about two extra minutes if you wanted to. All right, sounds good. I think that's something like 45 seconds each. So go ahead, Commissioner. Yeah, I'll um, jump in real quick. I think the the COVID lesson um, from re with regard to transportation is, uh, you know, obviously teleworking, you know, we reduced the demand, but also from the technology perspective, there are all kinds of additional data analytics tools and other kind of tools that have popped up lately for us to be able to better track and monitor what's going on. So uh, I, I think, you know, shifting work was huge, but we also need to really leverage the technology um, that has become available that allows us to really analyze those patterns and working with new employers that come in to both the mayor's comments and is really focusing new employment to areas away from the core. Thanks, Commissioner. Uh, Mayor Morgan? Yeah, I don't really have much to add on that. That's something that we've done at, at my workplace is we never really realized that we could have employees not in the office. And we learned that we could. And so we have started a, a telework where they're in the office some days and then other days they're at uh, uh, home. I think for cities like Round Rock, what we've got to do is you, 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 you're becoming your own city and we have to continue to be creative and be open to ideas that maybe 10, 15 years ago uh, we weren't open to. And I know that we have a very creative workforce up here. Uh, and I think that's something as leaders we have to do is be open to some ideas that when you first think about it, don't just shove it off, at least look at it, understand it, and then see if it's something that can be worked on. And we should always just depend on ourselves to try to make it happen at the local level. Thanks, Mayor. Mayor Mitchell? Well, I can't think of really anything to add. Uh, you know, the commentary has been pretty spot on. So, you know, we're just, we're, we're thankful for the incredible challenges that we face because, let, you know, let's be frank here. I, you know, I used to think that the city of Austin and the greater Austin area was growing fast. Uh, uh, and, and now I, in 2021, I look back and think, I think we're standing still because it's just been absolutely insane what we are dealing with, but the, you know, the challenges are, are many uh, and the time is now because if we are not making you know, strategic, bold uh, decisions right now, uh, we're gonna get left in the dust. And so certainly you know, the, the different things that we are working on is, is important and we need to continue that. Thanks, Mayor. Well, thanks, Senator Eckhart, Representative Israel, Commissioner Long. Mayor Morgan and Mayor Mitchell. And there's a few other questions in the Q&A if y'all wanted to reach out to those folks individually afterwards, maybe. Um, one about broadband, I see Senator, you may wanna talk to Matt, Matt Highland about that. But I'll pass it back to you, Anton. Thank you so much for having us today. Thank you guys for joining us. I'm humbled by the number of stakeholders we were able to bring to the table today. Um, I think, you know, we learned a lot today. Um, I think this was the easy part, discussion. Um, the hard part is putting all of this into action and I hope movability will be a moving force in doing that. Um, once again, I wanna thank our lead partners, the City of Austin, Downtown Austin Alliance and Capital Metro, all of our presenters, and of course our attendees. Um, quick follow-up for the summit. We will be sending out the recording um, as well as a follow-up survey to learn more about the experience. Um, we look forward to you guys taking that if you can. Um, with that, I will end the webinar. Thank you all for attending. Well done.